So thanks. Um, it turns out that variously we came to some of the same points that one of the three mics in this uh, morning session made. Um, some of this presentation is uh, highly relevant to Stanford. Some of it is more generally so, and some is interwoven. And I'd like to make it very plain to all of you that much of what I'm going to discuss with regard to the Stanford relevant items and the Stanford uh, services that uh, we provide have been developed by lots of other people than myself. So for instance, uh, Amy Hodge, who's sitting back there, excuse me, Ashley, Amy Hodge is there, Ashley Jester is there, uh, Alicia Montgomery is not here, uh, there are lots of other curators involved, including Grace and Stella. Um, there's a huge staff of uh, people in our Digital Library Systems and Services group that's been building these things on specs provided by some of these curators and others. Vijoy Abraham, Vijoy, leader of the Center for um, Interdisciplinary Digital Research, and his team have done some very interesting uh, projects, one of which I will try to show. And all to say that this is a team effort, big team, but a team effort nevertheless. <clears throat> The, um, uh, this is the uh, outline of what I intend to say. Uh, uh, some of it you can recognize as being uh, uh, maybe locally controversial, maybe not. Um, the news that I have for you is uh, probably not surprising to those of you who are already involved in open access publishing, but the university itself is now moving to an open access policy through CLIB, uh, in the chairmanship of, um, of uh, Jessica Riskin. How many of you are familiar with the terms and conditions of open access? Very few. So, well, maybe more. Show me your hands again. Maybe half. Okay, so the ba basic construct is that uh, the, the articles, the research reports are of no cost to anyone anywhere. Secondly, um, they are meant to be available to anyone in, anywhere with uh, little or no uh, uh, hurdles to go over. And third, they're intended to be unrestricted for use and for remixing. The, um, the developments here, I think, provide opportunities for the university press to provide new services to Stanford and for um, the use of the Stanford Digital Repository, which is both a hosting service and a digital archiving service, a hidden in one convenient phrase. Um, there are, of course, lots of requirements now from federal funding agencies and a great many uh, private funders that make um, uh, donations of money to enable research uh, possible only if those PIs will accept uh, the open access publishing um, um, requirements. Having looked around at this, having been a late adopter, I come to this very late, 20 years more after the fact, I'm coming to the place where I think that open access is very important for us and very important for the academy at large, and in general has gone from being a kind of infantile experiment to being something very solid and important. And uh, as I looked at all the possibilities, I think the Harvard model, both of their agreements in, in that university and with the support they provide to those who would engage in open access uh, publishing, a, really a, a great model. Um, <clears throat> Presently, the Stanford Digital Repository has about 700 terabytes of content in the hosting side and in the digital archive side, but we will add another 800 terabytes in the course of this year and next uh, both from the Google Books project and from various media ingestions. Um, I would also mention to you that the Stanford Digital Repository is actually a backup archive for GitHub, recently uh, 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 enabled. Take us some little while to do that effectively, but it's, um, but it's happening. So the, those who are very fond of the open access model tend to be in some fields and not in others. So folks in the life sciences and medicine, physical sciences, engineering, and computer science tend to be OIA positive. Uh, those in the social sciences tend to be 
OA agnostic or conflicted, and those in the arts and humanities uh, haven't heard of it. Uh, it's not it's not a huge uh, spot in their in their lives. Um, this is a recent uh, report in something called Portal Libraries and Academy. It's a it's a preprint, and once again the preprint uh, effect starting with archive that started roughly 1992 with Paul Kinspark at uh, Los Alamos, then becoming uh, more, more widely used as it went to Cornell, but still not achieving its full uh, benefit by expanding itself beyond basic uh, high energy physics and, and related physics um, uh, pro um, domains. Um, on the other hand, the BioX uh, archive and the, uh, I think there's a chemistry archive now underway too, seem to show that this whole effect is, is uh, starting up. The Ginspark um, uh, was annoying to people in the American Physical Society, to say the least. Uh, but uh, they resolved their annoyance by understanding it over time by, by authors having deposited in the uh, archive, uh, the articles are getting better by what amounted to open peer review. Uh, open peer review tried and still in effect at the British Medical uh, Society, BMJ, British Medical Journal, with support from Highwire, at first showed remarkably little results. But they've continued that program and post-publication peer review continues to be um, important. Uh, for those who read that journal and make use of those findings. The fear to begin with was that uh, therapeutic advice um, appearing without peer review would be questionable in the minds of the docs, the, the actual practitioners. Uh, and it was, it was. But over time, there's been more respect for the, uh, for the open peer review and therefore they've continued and uh, without any uh, noticeable effects on um, on the use of therapies. Um, inherent in all of this open access business is um, the question of impact factors and discoverability. I'll come back to discovery, discoverability, but the impact factor at a place like this is just irrelevant. It's, it's simply not, doesn't count for anything. It counts for a lot of other smaller, less productive places. Um, however, we find that the uh, for-profit publishers uh, dine out on impact factors, corrupt data, and uh, not just the for-profits, uh, the ostensible, uh, uh, the obvious for-profits, but some of the non-obvious ones like the American Chemical Society. So recognizing that there's been this um, standoff at Cal between the University of California and Elsevier, I see the probability of what's coming to that juncture as our contract with Elsevier ages and will finally go out of play in a couple of years. And I imagine, I hope, that going open access here through the Academic Senate and the CLIB resolution that's coming in the spring will result in us having more grist, more muscle, more tension in the relationship than there has been. Um, we've already started working on reducing the number of titles we get to the Elsevier license, but um, more to be said as we go along. <clears throat> Let's see how far I've gotten here. Here's some of the issues. Um, Mike Frank pointed out the relevance of uh, domain and discipline sp uh, specific um, uh, repositories. It's absolutely true, should be accommodated, can be easily accommodated, even in a general purpose repository and digital archive. But the Truth is that the number of open access articles is frighteningly small, and there's a lot more that could be happening there. Therefore, the, the attempt that we created in the libraries a long, long time ago, in the 90s, to promote licensing by authors, not delivering copyright for free to the publishers, needs to become the norm here, not the exception. Once that starts to happen here and elsewhere, there'll be a lot more leverage on the for-profits. And indeed, I think they will finally have to uh, go from open access options to, to uh, open access publishing itself. Another aspect of this um, regime has to, uh, the regime of openness has to do with data management plans required by the federal funding agencies. We provide several aids to that. And I think they've been pretty effective. I don't know how many people have used them. We don't have any figures on that. But, the, but this is a way of, make, of easing the entry point to um, openness 
and satisfying the funding agencies. <clears throat> uh, I note, however, that um, there is one new approach called the Easy Data Management Plan, ezdmp.org, which is a project that was funded by the NSF by some people very dear to us. I'm specifically re referring to Victoria Stodden, a PhD from Stanford, a, a Donahoe uh, student. We love her. Uh, she'll be here now and again forever, I'm sure. But it's not a very good approach. It doesn't refer to the modern version of the NSF um, division's requirements. It does, it's not obviously engaging with them. Um, why would one want to put material into the Stanford Digital Repository instead of a, um, of a domain-specific repository? My first response to the question is that it needn't be one or the other. It can be both. My second is that the SDR should be a place where we could define and or adopt and back up a domain-specific repository. However, when one deposits into the SDR, you get a a permanent URL and a reliable web, web link back to the, to the source of the data, including the, the, the publication. And it makes it easier, your own licensing rules around your data. It makes it easier for others to find it. And because the Stanford Library's website is spidered every week by Google, whatever we put up, therefore appears in Google and Google Scholar very quickly. So, so in some sense, the marketing the public access to information about the data set, about the article, about the, even the ebook, um, is quickly uh, uh, taken care of by, by that Google uh, spidering. So um, a big topic in this whole domain, in this today's uh, conversation, has been about research reports as functional tools. How can the, the operating aspects of the, of the, um, the data analyzed be made accessible? How can it easily uh, pave the way so that someone just reads the article, quickly links to the data, quickly links to the code, and quickly begins either a mashup or just uh, redoing the, uh, rep replicating the experiment. Thinking back to 1995 when we started Highwire, the enhancements that were made in the first 10 years of Highwire all had to do with what now seems trivial, more color, more moving images, more hyperlinks, uh, better process in the, in the act of publishing, uh, free back issues and toll free linking, which made Highwire for a long time the largest supplier of what were free, freely available uh, articles, freely available to some at least. Um, all of this done with the cooperation of scholarly societies as publishers very few for-profits involved, but it drove, these developments drove what happened with all the others as we went along. That is not the same thing as a research article as a functional tool, as an aspect of the next wave of, of research and, and then uh, reports. So there's this thing called Code Ocean. How many know about Code Ocean? Okay, I don't have to go pretty far on that. Uh, point though is that Code Ocean purports to be an environment and probably is an environment where the research report is a functional tool and can serve in that way. So um, I think that assembling all these elements and providing experiences for others and therefore prototypes for others in sufficient size and of sufficient importance might therefore drive others to join the party, a good thing. Uh, whether it's Code Ocean or somebody else, it doesn't matter. In fact, it could be any publisher if they're willing to, to do it. Now, Code Ocean purports to have lots of extra tools. The problem with lots of extra tools have to do with um, very specific um, uh, functionality and applications which are not generally accessible. They're, they want to make their money from being um, uh, the sole supplier of some of these functions. So I, I'm a little bit... Um, mm, jaundice about Code Ocean and look for other opportunities. I'm going rapidly through this paper of mine because so much has been um, discussed by others. Big problem of peer review, what gets peer reviewed, how it gets peer reviewed, whether it's peer reviewed at all, realizing that the experience that uh, we've had um, 
uh, I lost my train here, um, with PLOS. So PLOS, uh, Public Library of Science started basically here at Berkeley. Pat Brown here, very enthused uh, supporter, uh, makes a lot of money from his author publishing charges uh, for those who come to PLOS One. They redistribute that money uh, after a very brief peer review in PLOS One to real heavy peer review in the other PLOS journals, of which I think there are seven or eight. They get a lot of play, and only occasional articles in PLOS One get a lot of play. Somehow PLOS has figured out how to identify the articles that are getting a lot of play in PLOS One, and they get some marketing done through the public newspapers on those studies. But point though is that peer review is fundamental, and without peer review, much of what we do is suspect. It's a problem, even inside, inside the university. So um, nature has created um, uh, an environment where they say that the research articles they publish or could publish are in fact functional research tools. I don't have any experience of that and I couldn't find very many of them. So it's not clear to me that this is true, but it's clear that they have decided, Springer Nature has decided, that there's, a, there's a, mm, an advantage to them in playing that game. And that's the first sign I've seen of a big one going in that direction. I think it's a good model in a sense. I'd like to see them do more. I'd like to see others imitate that. So the, the guiding principle they are asserting is that the um, mandatory data availability is number one, and number two, that the statements about that availability and, the, and the, the data itself has to have enough information about code that makes, it, uh, makes these articles replicable. Presently a huge problem, of course. Other nature um, uh, journals have had peer-reviewed code uh, and they say central to the paper, but uh, it's been difficult for there to be peer review of data sets and of code. That continues to be the problem. And therefore, I think there's got to be some more devotion to these possibilities by scientists here and everywhere. We still have to develop the right platform, and it may very well be that having a common digital repository for Stanford authors might then provide us, even given the disciplinarily devoted uh, segments of such a thing, or, 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 dig or disciplinary um, repositories elsewhere, might give us more experience in peer-reviewing code and data, which therefore might be more um, um, revealing and more exciting for others to undertake. It's cumbersome. <clears throat> it's difficult. Uh, we need more compute space, we need more compute time, uh, we need more guidelines, we need to have more examples of things not working very well. Does Code Ocean go in that direction? I'm not sure. They say they have their own platform, but I don't know very many people who are publishing there, and they, they don't provide very many examples either. So the big problem is um, um, Understanding what the code does, understanding what the data is, how it's been mashed up, where it's come from, where it can be made accessible. <clears throat> and then the time involved in doing the work on the code and the, with the code on the data and seeing whether the uh, items can be, uh, findings can be replicated. And indeed making it possible for others to take that code and mash it up with yet other code and get more utility out of these various pieces to get assembled for somebody else's research. <clears throat> So one of the opportunities here is to make use of another Stanford product called LOX, which is a network caching uh, access and preservation environment, LOX, L-O-C-K-S-S. Locks of copies keep stuff safe. This also began to be de developed in the late 90s by folks in the Stanford libraries, now very widely used, about to uh, experience a great renaissance with a, a brand new um, code set behind it. But fundamentally, it enables um, mother files to be distributed widely for access and then ultimately for preservation. There is a controlled locks called clocks, controlled lots of copies keeps us safe, uh, which involves most of the for-profit publishers, lots of them, and lots and lots of libraries. And the 
uh, publishers deposit their um, their articles, and presumably they could deposit their code and their uh, data into uh, about 12 different repositories spread around the world. And that information is released on, on, the, uh, on conditions. The terms and conditions involve a publisher going toes up, uh, deciding to close, and then uh, no one taking it up, replicating the, the journal itself. Uh, and actually, we have very few examples of that happening. But the point is that the code is, is uh, the code and the journal articles are preserved elsewhere than in the uh, the, the for-profit publishing house uh, own um, own servers. So, Clocks is also uh, uh, is owned by uh, by the libraries who are participating and by the publishers, <clears throat> but it uses this Locks technology to uh, in a controlled way to have um, these services provided. I will note, however, that due to our concerns, uh, some countries have not been able to get our permission to run a clocks uh, box, a clock server. I refer specifically to China, PRC. Uh, we're quite convinced that they would have um, reversed the, the underlying technology and made it uh, valuable to them and them alone. Uh, we have 12 different uh, locations, many of them in the US and Europe. And uh, we're very careful to make sure that they are not uh, broken open. So the position of David Donahoe in, the, in all this is quite remarkable. And uh, I don't know, David. David, are you in the room now? No. This afternoon. And I won't be here this afternoon, so I'll miss him. But his, um, his work starting in the 1990s on this was really quite far-reaching and foresight foresightful, and uh, his work continues with this wonderful article in the Harvard uh, Data Service Review called, Data Science Review, and called Ambitious Data Science Can Be Painless. H how many have read this article? Yeah, very few. This is a must read for anybody who believes in open science and in data science developments because he provides examples with his colleagues of um, gigantic data sets and the possibilities for automating analysis in the cloud. So data storage in the cloud, where the Stanford Digital Repository is headed right now, yes, storage, but also uh, cloud computing and how that might work. So let me just read this um, abstract that he provides. <clears throat> I quote, modern data science research at the cutting edge can involve massive computational experimentation. An ambitious PhD in computational fields may conduct experiments consuming several million CPU hours. Traditional computing practices in which researchers use laptops, PCs, or campus resident resources, like our own uh, research uh, computing facility, <clears throat> um, are awkward or inadequate for experiments at the massive scale and varied scope that we now see in the most ambitious data science. On the other hand, modern cloud computing promises seemingly unlimited computational resources that can be custom configured and seems to offer a powerful new venue for ambitious data-driven science. Exploiting the cloud fully, the amount of raw experimental work that could be completed in a fixed amount of uh, calendar time ought to expand by several orders of magnitude. Still, at the moment, starting a massive experiment using cloud resources from scratch is commonly perceived as cumbersome, problematic, and prone to researcher burnout. He goes on, new software stacks are emerging that render massive cloud-based experiments relatively painless, thereby allowing a proliferation of ambitious experiments for scientific discovery. Such stacks simplify experimentation by systematizing experiment definition, automating distribution, and management of all tasks, and allowing easy harvesting of results and documentation. He then goes on to discuss this whole approach. It seems very convincing to me. And um, I think what's lacking in our particular situ situation are first some more examples of this highly ambitious data science with the gigantic data sets. I would suggest that looking at um, genomic gen and precision medicine would be one, climate change would be another one. 
uh, sustaining the environment uh, related, of course, would be another one. Uh, I think any of the social science data sets, including neuroimaging, provides some other very interesting possibilities. And what it takes is money. It's, it's a simple thing. And some of that money could be yielded from federal grants, not unlike the grants that support Slack. How, how genuinely contributive might be some of these big projects. The promises are enormous, but we won't know until you all get to perform this ambitious uh, uh, data science. So we're, by the way, using uh, SDR, um, uh, Amazon Web Services, and the IBM Cloud. So we have redundant um, systems and redundant storage on the LOX principle. Lots of copies keep stuff safe, which I remind you has to do with the ancient experience of libraries being all over the place and therefore very difficult for all of them to be suppressed or weeded inappropriately or at all. Okay, moving rapidly ahead because there's too much detail here. Um, I'd like to show you something from the smaller and slower realms, those are the humanities. Because there is data sharing going on there, masked by other terms, but I wanna show you a couple of examples. Now, could you show me how to get this thing over to uh, something? <clears throat> Shortcut right here, command. So I'll be back Let me go to Chrome or something. How many of you know of Walter Scheidel's work about uh, the economics of trade and transportation in the Imperial Roman Empire? One person, nine your poly. Vijoy. Vijoy's group is responsible for making it happen. Okay, can I see it on this one? Um, so, for, so I can type it in. Do I can't get a, a dual? No, I don't need a dual. I can come back to this. I need this. I need to be able to see what I'm doing. Otherwise, I'm going to screw up. There we go. Where is it? You had it. Yep, it's it's coming. It's coming. Oh, geez. There you go. Okay. So um, is it out there now? Yeah, I'm gonna be bringing it back because it gets it's a little clunky right now. And now, wherever you want to go. You can't do it. You can't do both? It's word. We're, we're, we're making it work. So if you wanted the first tab. Gee whiz. Um, so here we are at Orbis. Now I have to be able to see this. I'm sorry. We have to, we're just going to go into Chrome and I'll come back somehow. Let's put, why can't I just call up Chrome on this thing down here? It's, so I can bring up another tab for you and then I can do it on your screen as well. Okay, good. And then now you, now you, now you. Okay. Yes. So, hmm. Okay. Now is it the two separate scenarios? The two separate scenarios here. This is tough. Yeah. Is there a new? Well, it's called it's going to set up for we're going to make it we'll make it work. Can we get to systems preferences so we can mirror? Let's do that. Yes, I know. Well, um, Charles, the big mirror maybe I can bring up a fly in Boston. Please do. Boston um, Cuban is expensive. Yes, it is. Um, and one concern I have, so I mean, I'm involved with the Stanford facility, and, um, and, and I think that actually having on premise compute capacity is really important because I think it's really bad when people start to worry about, when students start to worry about how much money this analysis will cost. It's going to inhibit, it's going to inhibit creativity, right? When you have to worry about, you know, this analysis costing $4,000 and whether it's worth it. Right. And the other, but the other benefit of having our own research computing facility is that wonderful staff who will be equally helpful in cloud computing. 
And given the expense of so many things that we do around here, and I'm specifically referring to the Slack example, uh, and much of what goes on in the School of Medicine and the hospitals, we really ought to be doing this. And we really ought to find ways to, to get some serious money to enable some sample projects that will drive them others. Okay, so here's uh, Walter Scheidel, Professor in Classics approach to showing the cost and time and treasure of moving goods around the Roman Empire at its height. What does he do? He, um, he knows about lots and lots of articles <clears throat> about money and the economics of trade in the Roman Empire. It's the, the literature is full, it's been gathered over the last 200 years. He needed, however, to consolidate much of that information in what amounts to a great giant data mashup, which he did with the help of a bunch of students. He then depended upon the use of geospatial in, uh, inf uh, information systems to begin to show off what was possible. So I'm going to go here and enter the term Londinium, which is London. And down here, I can just enter the term Alexandria. That's a Alex, Alex, Andrea. And we can select a season. Let's select, uh, let's select winter and look for the fastest. And let's go and calculate the route. So London, as you see, is up here. And Alex is down here. Take a minute. And you'll see that it's a mixed route. It's the winter time. He comes down, he goes around the Alps. He goes down to uh, what is now um, Libya, comes across the Carthage, and ultimately they sail on down by way of Sicily to Alexandria. The cost of doing this, let me see here, you see this bar down here, this is um, a kind of perspective, this is another plot of duration, a plot of distance, how it might look if you went by donkey, by wagon, by carriage, and um, per kilogram of wheat by donkey, the cost of 2075, by wagon, uh, 2503, and by a per passenger in a carriage, God only knows what that carriage would look like, it would be 1737 denarii uh, per passenger. We don't see anything here for ship because it's a mixed route, I gather. So the point is you could keep changing these attributes. So we could go from Londinium to um, uh, uh, Smyrna. Let's see if I can spell this right there and calculate the route. <clears throat> and there you see another variation. That we could change that to summer, do another calculation, changes all together. So this is a very cool and early um, digital humanities approach. And it is the result of great scholarship, but it also supports scholarship. This has been shared as widely it's open available. And we, um, we believe that the model, the, the recipe for this is replicable in other settings and other timeframes. So that's one, um, that's, uh, one of great interest. Um, another is a more direct um, example, and I want to show you something that we, oops, I'm sure that's right. I don't know, it's not quite right. No, 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 no. So you may, some of you may be aware that, uh, that, um, Stanford libraries have been involved in large scale digitization of resources starting in the late 90s with the digitization of the GAD archive in uh, Geneva. We then became involved starting in 2002 with the great uh, rare book collection uh, gathered by Matthew Parker, the first Archbishop of Canterbury under Elizabeth I, who got a commission to gather uh, in his personal library uh, works that he considered to be um, illustrative of a separate lineage for the Church of England from the, set, from the Church of Rome. Remember that Henry VIII um, uh, 
uh, extracted the Church of England from the Church of Rome, made it report to him. Um, but essentially, it's, it remained unchanged as a as a liturgy, as it was a Roman liturgy until Elizabeth I, who's a devoted Protestant, the daughter of Anne Boleyn, um, got in, got into office after Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary, and um, uh, he, she told Matthew Parker to turn the church into a Protestant church. He proceeds to do so over the course of his several many years as the Archbishop, the first her first Archbishop of Canterbury. So I show you this because this is a um, more recent set of developments than the Matthew Parker Project, which came to life in roughly 2007, 2008, 550 some odd manuscripts. This is a project we did with the Vatican Library. And why do I call it um, open uh, data sharing? I call it that because there are 18,000 manuscripts that show up in this, um, in this uh, site, here's one. I'm just choosing this at random. So there are several technologies involved here. One of which is a plat an open platform that we've developed here that's being used not just for this sort of project, but also for projects involving many nations in the Middle East called the Digital Library of the Middle East. And why is that interesting? It's, all of this is interesting because it enables the kind of data sharing in humanist terms vastly different than what is involved in, I'm getting to a page here, don't worry, um, here we go. Now, this is a very early Latin script, okay? Uh, if you wanted to search and work on Hilarious, you would have to go to the Vatican among other places and sit there for a while in their manuscript reading room and work on this manuscript. But now because of digitization, and this project that we did with them that was funded by the Mellon Foundation, one can do this work practically anywhere. It's about 5% of the work that um, manuscript scholars do that depends upon the artifact per se. The rest of it is all about text and imagery. I wanna take you back just a little bit and make another point, um, which has to do with annotation. Uh, come on, here we go. I'm going to show you some annotations, and I show you these annotations um, specifically with the idea that um, I'm trying to find another manuscript. Here we go. So, as you can see from this page, there are various um, elements of the page that have been isolated. That deserve attention. All of these visible to anybody who wants to come by. So, for instance, um, this is a, a sample annotation. Why is annotation important? It's important because it causes communication or could cause communication to occur between scholars, scholar to student, scholar to the world, whatever. The same processes could and I think should appear in the scientific literature, particularly with regard to these more problematic aspects of some of which have come up today. So this, this approach is supported by something called the International Image Interoperability Framework, largely developed here, particularly in the architecture and the management of the developing the development community, which is now about 125 people worldwide. There are at least 300 institutions who are using this, these APIs of the IIIF, the International Image Interoperability Framework, for all kinds of information and cultural objects, including sculpture. So biological models could be presented in this. And um, moving pictures, audio, time-based media can be used uh, can be viewed, compared, annotated in this environment. It's open, it's free. It could be used for scientific articles, for instance. We believe we'll start using it for government documents, for instance. So the, the point is that this is another one of these developments that have occurred here that's been spread around very widely uh, around the world. The problem that we have, to be very frank, is that we live uh, with something on the order of a billion and a half or two billion images 
from these 300 or more cultural uh, organizations, libraries, archives, and museums, but we don't have an easy way for you to determine what you want to see. And given that there are lots of uh, manuscripts that are spread around thanks to various wars and perturbations that relate to one another, either by a handwriting style, by content, by author, by the monastery that made it, etc., we need to be able to make it possible for scholars to compare uh, manuscripts in, in various sizes and uh, various places. So the point is that this, this um, discovery possibility is quite lacking right now, and we've got a team of about 30 people working on it who I believe in a couple of years will begin to produce some kind of a um, path to success so it's more easy to discover this stuff. This is for the humanities data sharing. And the annotations are further the sharing of scholarly uh, insights into this, um, this sort of literature. Okay. I would also say that um, the, uh, I guess go back to the home page here of this uh, site at the Vatican. Great fun, by the way, working at the Vatican. You get to go in the back door and uh, get access to the museum at odd hours when there aren't 10,000 people per square foot to impede your progress. We we're gonna do some more projects with these folks. This Greek paleographic uh, exhibit actually becomes a textbook on how to read ancient Greek. So the use of annotation as an instructional framework is also very, very important and completely adaptable to the scientific world. So let me conclude this so there might be some time for challenges to me. Um, these these um, prospects, these, this is some of the conversation we've already had about trollers uh, who would um, make difficult our, uh, our work in social context, political, ideological context, is a big, a big issue. Uh, from my perspective, um, we have the anti-vaxxers, we have the intelligent design people, we have the climate change deniers, uh, we've got all kinds of people with ideological political access to grind, and it does take uh, a lot out of one's life and really uh, mentality and maybe even life-threatening to publish in these areas. And yet, it's important that we do, at least I think so. There's, the question then becomes, how do we handle this? How do we, as individuals, as units in an institution, and as an institution, support people who end up being trolled by these folks? And I think some of the answer has to do with some advice from the likes of our general counsel and the um, university communications folks in supporting us and giving us advice on how to respond or even whether to respond on the one hand, and on the other hand, support legal support so that we can deal with these, these problems. But given the political nature of our society, the American society right now today, this is, these are issues that are not going to go away, and yet um, they impede science. And one might take note, by the way, of um, Michelle's example of the BDA, the NRA, no, the NRA, ARA, NRA, that until recently, uh, there was no federal support for any kind of study on, on uh, use of weapons. They, all, they say guns. They're weapons, okay? They are weapons. Um, it has been forbidden. Only recently has the CDC begun to be able to look at uh, gun deaths. So it's a crying shame. It's a mess. So we have an election coming up in some months. I think we should be voting. Thanks. Sorry this was disjointed, but that's the nature of my life.